should there be standards regards environmental requirements? Um, do we just export um, our standards uh, that we have in this country to be undermined overseas? And how do we get that balance right? Um, I think it's a critical question to get you know, broad community support um, about uh, you know, how free trade uh, is free, how it is non-discriminatory, and how do you make all of that transparent? Obviously it's a complex issue. A trade agreement can't do everything. Uh, it can't um, achieve higher living standards, uh, trade union rights, a, a brilliant environment and so on. There are various mechanisms uh, that can be deployed, but I go back to the first principle of this, is that if you live, if through trade you can lift the living standards of trading partners, then you've got a better chance of um, you know, improving the quality of the environment, for example. Uh, these things can be taken uh, to two poles, I think. One is, and I haven't thankfully heard this proposition, that we shouldn't trade with countries that have lower environmental or labour standards than Australia. Well, there goes Australia as a trading nation. I suppose there'd be one or two countries that would have similar ones. I haven't heard that. On the other hand, there are very tokenistic um, provisions that are put into trade agreements that seem to make some people happy and probably don't do much harm. I think that um, it is worth saying that um, the purpose of a trade agreement shouldn't be to encourage other countries to lower their standards and, and you know, to compete on the basis of, um, of that. But uh, I just come back to the view that a trade agreement can't do everything. And the point was made earlier that maybe not everything that we do in economic interaction should be through a trade agreement. Hi, um, my name's Preethi, I'm from uh, the Nikkei. I'd like to ask uh, Dr Emerson, you were critical of the US FTA and the concessions that were made. In the uh, negotiations with the, the Japanese FTA, given the domestic situation in Japan, isn't it inevitable large concessions will be, need to, will be needed by Australians, especially in the agricultural sector? Uh, well, let's wait and see. We had a visit by the uh, Japanese foreign minister who's also has responsibility for trade negotiations. He flew through the night uh, in the second, in the last week of Parliament to arrive here on Tuesday morning and then flew through the night to get back home, uh, outlining the basic policy on comprehensive partnership agreements uh, and indicating that through that policy, Japan is genuinely interested in liberalising its agricultural trade. Uh, we're engaged now uh, in uh, discussions with Japan on that and uh, as I said in my speech um, we don't do this just for the sake of it and for people like uh, Bruce Gosper here to whiz around the world and you know enjoy the high life because it's actually a punishing <laughs> life um, but it is quite high about 36,000 um, feet but the, the point is we, we're just not doing these for the sake of doing them for this sort of having a a, a, a trophy on the mantelpiece saying, look, we've got a free trade deal. It's the quality of the content and we'll be engaging with Japan to seek you know, a very high quality agreement. Uh, my criticism of the US-Australia FTA was of some elements of it. Uh, I don't say for a moment that there's no good in that agreement, but I do think that um, everyone in this room and every politician and every trade union official and every business person has a right to make a comment on the proposed content of a proposed agreement. And Tony Sheldon just did that. He's entitled to do that. And I just found that at that time, when I had something to say about some of the provisions, I had the coalition saying that proves that Emerson is anti-American and un-Australian. And I really resent that. We've had a question here and then one here. <laughs> Uh, Harley Wright from Climate Sense. I have a question for Professor Hoda. You mentioned uh, the potential for carbon tariffs if there's no agreement, sensible agreement on emission cuts. Could you elaborate on that, please, and the potential for trade wars from carbon tariffs? I think the, uh, at present we have the situation that uh, in two uh, economies, both the United States and uh, the European Union. They are uh, working towards uh, a legislation that will involve uh, 
some sort of uh, penalty on uh, imports from countries which do not have the same levels of uh, environmental uh, laws and regulations. Uh, uh, what they say is that unless we do that, we are uh, putting our own economic operators at a disadvantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis our competitors. And the other point is that there would be a leakage of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the carbon uh, measures that they take, that is the, the uh, climate change measures, that instead of production in their country, they will go to some other uh, sort of uh, country. And so the world will be, uh, 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 the world will not uh, gain in net terms. That's why they are thinking of it. What I said uh, uh, on this aspect is that technically it is possible to uh, take measures consistently with the broad uh, uh, principles of the WTO uh, to import, uh, to impose such uh, uh, measures. Although there are certain aspects of the, um, uh, of the rules, which would be very difficult to comply. And ultimately, each case will go up in a dispute. What I was saying was that in a situation, in the situation that exists today, in which uh, many countries want developing countries also to undertake some obligations, uh, this kind of uh, measures taken, uh, border carbon measures that are taken, would be in the gray area as far as the international uh, WTO law is concerned. So instead of uh, 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 taking recourse to such border carbon measures, the best situation would be for having a compact I mean, the Copenhagen Accord must be translated into a proper compact which lays down very clearly who has to do what. And once that is done, then maybe there will be no need for border carbon measures or there will be need for it only if some country is not observing the compact. Uh, Trevor Rowe, I'd like to ask... Uh... The Minister, a question if I could. Dr. Emerson, you know, I applaud your commitment to the multilateral trading system. And I'll ask you, uh, I'd like your reaction to a really simple proposition. There was a propensity to support bilateral trading arrangements over the years gone by on the argument that the multilateral trading system had either stalled or the enforcement around the multilateral trading system had proven to be ineffective. Do you believe that bilateral trading arrangements and a multilateral regime can exist side by side? I think they can, but uh, there are necessary conditions for that to happen. Uh, and if the bilateral trading arrangements are preferential uh, and have no regard to, or little regard to the world trading rules, then to use the terminology, they become stumbling blocks, not building blocks towards the multilateral system. My own view, and this may be a misty-eyed view, is that um, we shouldn't give up on the global system. There is a lot of pessimism around the Uruguay round, and people were saying this is going nowhere fast. And while it is true that the Uruguay round, I think, lasted about seven years, uh, and the Doha round is into its 10th year, I think. Um, uh, you, you're going to obviously get more people saying Doha's dead as a dodo and forget about it. Well, I'm not going to do that uh, on Australia's behalf. And we've been involved in, uh, I think, meaningful, encouraging discussions. So we're going to really give Doha a red hot go in 2011. Now, that doesn't mean Australia can... You know, stomp our feet and, and tell everyone to do the deal. But if we've got 
the sort of credibility that I mentioned in my speech, because we have done this unilaterally, to say as almost honest brokers, uh, I think there is a real possibility. I won't put it as a certainty, but we're talking about services. That could be the key, that we fix up any remaining disagreements in relation to the package that was put in 2008, then augment it with a group of different, different groups of services that might give a country like the United States good enough reason to go to the whole Congress and say there's something in this for everyone in the United States. And at the moment, they feel that there's not enough that they can uh, say to Congress people that this is good for America and also good for the poorest countries on earth. So I think that might be the key that unlocks it, but we'll give it a red hot go. Could, could I just add something there? I think it's, uh, I think, agree absolutely with the Minister. You, you have to keep going with the multilateral initiative. Unfortunately, we all have our down days, as we've had a few in the last five years or so. Um, but good bilateral agreements will help you eventually get to a multilateral solution. Because captivating everyone at one time is a very, very hard thing to do. And I think the process of change will take a little time. But you shouldn't just throw away the multilateral and go everyone bilateral, because that will, will give you bad bilateral agreements. So hopefully, uh, running on two tracks with good bilateral agreements will eventually get us to a, a proper place. Uh, but it will take time. And now, please, could you join me in thanking our three very excellent speakers today? <laughs>